Welcome to Taiwan Brief, a deep dive look into Taiwan affairs. Now, this is the same 10 to 15 minute show we've been calling Taiwan Report News Brief, but with a briefer name. All right, I'm Donovan Smith. Let's jump right in. The KMT finally has some dates for the chair race. So today we're going to do a deep dive on the race, the candidates, both declared and possible, and their chances. I think this may be one of the most important, if not the most important, KMT chair race in modern history. The reason I'm watching it so closely is that Taiwan's democracy at the national level is dysfunctional. To a certain degree, that's always been true. In the 1990s, the dysfunction was the two main parties had very different ideas on what the country was. One was loyal to Taiwan and the other to the Republic of China. That's obviously not a normal situation. However, in those days, both the KMT and DPP could be relied on to defend the country, whichever name you decided to call it. The KMT was reliably anti-communist, allied with the United States, and determined to maintain the Republic of China's continued existence. Since then, things have changed. Starting with Lian Zhan's chairmanship, the party moved closer to China in the early 2000s. Interactions grew increasingly close, money got involved, and a whole so-called comprador class entered the party. This, combined with the party's traditional one-China stance and belief that Taiwanese were Chinese, led to a situation where many in the KMT were effectively collaborating with the enemy. This started to become obvious to the general public during the Mainzhou years. He let military spending dwindle. He risked hollowing out chunks of the economy with trade deals, introduced irritants in the relationship with Japan, and met with Xi Jinping. This led to a huge backlash in the form of the Sunflower Movement which saw hundreds of thousands flood the streets in protest. Since then, identifying as Taiwanese continued to grow, but more importantly, deepened for many. Simultaneously, the PRC under Xi Jinping has grown increasingly hostile and threatening, launched a genocide in East Turkestan, also called Xinjiang, and in Hong Kong made a total lie of the very one country, two systems that the PRC was offering Taiwan, and then explicitly tied it to the 1992 consensus. These shifts meant that the majority of Taiwanese voters turned against the 1992 consensus and any talk of one China, both of which the KMT espouses. The party has bled support on the national level, and the party's membership under the age of 40 dropped to just over 2%. This has led to -to back-to-back landslide losses in the presidential races and produced only about a third of the, sorry, and reduced them to only about a third in the legislature. Worse for the KMT, the party is facing financial and demographic disaster. So while they haven't yet totally collapsed and they remain viable in local elections, they're facing a future of turning into a broke old folks home. Meanwhile, the three viable opposition parties, the Taiwan People's Party, the New Power Party, and the Taiwan State Building Party, have been only slowly gaining traction, and the NPP seems determined to shoot itself in the foot every step of the way. This has left a lopsided situation where the DPP virtually has a lock on the presidency, barring a complicated multi-candidate showdown. And that's not healthy. The longer the DPP remains in power, as with any party any, anywhere in the world with a lock on power, the more corrupt and arrogant it will get. There needs to be a viable opposition long term. That's why this KMT chair race is so crucial. It will determine if the party has any hope of being viable again. It has the experience, networks, and people that the smaller parties lack but an ideology that's effectively toxic to the majority of voters. Some in the party understand the writing is on the wall. Current chair Johnny Chang does get it and has tried to drop the 92 consensus, move the party closer to what they were in the 90s and closer to the U.S. as and staunch defenders of the ROC. He's been stymied in much of this, however. 
Party membership under 40 has writ- risen, but on- only to a little over 3%. This election will also tell us a lot about the where the party stands by their choice of chair. The party tends to pick less influential chairs during by-elections, like Johnny Jiang and Hong Xiu Zhu. But this is a full-term election, which they tend to take far more seriously, and the candidates tend to be the kind of heavyweights with the sort of influence that they can use to change the direction of the party. So, who they choose is hugely consequential for the future of just not just the party, but the direction of Taiwan's democracy. So let's dive in. This is from the KMT press release. Quote, the Guomindang's Central Standing Committee passed an amendment to the 2021 election operation schedule for the chairmanship election and the 21st National Party represent- Representatives election. Prospective candidates can ob- obtain registration forms on August 12th and 13, while candidate registration is on for August 16 and 17. The campaigning period will take place from September 11th through September 24th. The press release continues further down with this. Voting would be held on September 25th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. The election results will be announced before September 28th, and the results will be certified by the CSC on September 29th. And now, the vote had been scheduled for July, but was delayed due to the Level 3 lockdown. One thing the press release leaves out is that current chair Johnny Chang's term ends on August 18th. He has already announced that once he registers to be reelected, which is the 16th or 17th, he will immediately take a leave of absence. Though some other names have been floated in the press, most likely current KMT Secretary General Li Qianlong will serve during that transition period. Now, there are four already declared candidates, current chair and lawmaker Jiang Jiang or Jiang Jisun, Jiang, Jiang Yazhong, president of the KMT's Sun Yat-sen School, Wei Tao, former head of the Directorate General of Budget, Accounting and Statistics, and former Zhanghua County Commissioner Zhuo Boyuan. So let's start with Wei. He's a largely faceless bureaucrat who was born in China in 1949 and who is most famous for being on his third wife, who is 30 years younger than himself. He's such an unknown that when he announced he was going to run, former president and KMT chair Ma ying commented, who is that? He's headed up various government departments and state-owned Taiwan Tobacco and Liquor and claims if he wins, he won't take a salary and won't run for office. In his announcement, his promises were nondescript, vague to an extreme, advocating, among among other things, clean government and peace. So it's good to know he's not running on a platform of corruption and bloody mayhem in the streets. Usually in local commentary, they don't even bother to mention him. It's totally unclear why he's running and doesn't appear to have even enough support for other candidates to court his support. Maybe. He just wants to impress his wife. My suggestion on his campaign is to pose with his wife with a big grin and a thumbs up with a slogan, way to go. Former Zhanghua County Commissioner Zhuo Boyuan is someone I'm more familiar with from reporting on him for ICRT's Central Taiwan News. Mostly, the reporting was on various corruption scandals involving his family members, including his brother who went to jail. From memory, one of the scandals was kickbacks over orders of garbage bags for the county EPA, and another was mishandling of funds for Ma ying second presidential run, something that Ma apparently had nothing to do with and was the victim of. He supports the 92 consensus and better relations with China. He's another candidate who also lacks widespread name recognition, though Ma definitely wouldn't have to ask who he is. <laughs> He's not even all that popular in Zhanghua. After being term limited out of the commissioner post, he ran for a legislative seat that saw a violent primary, and he went on to lose anyway. He is probably a long shot, but perhaps he's hoping the run will raise his profile for the future, 
something that Han Guoyu did to good effect after losing in his KMT chair run. My suggested campaign for him is him sitting in a pile of cash with a slogan, Zhuo knows how to handle campaign funds. So what about Zhang Yazhong, president of the KMT's Sun Yat-sen school? He's a bit of a gadfly whose main claim to fame is running for KMT chair and contesting the KMT presidential primary and getting absolutely slaughtered. And now he's at it again. He's a mainlander with strong ties to the PRC, going there often, and supports a policy of one China, three constitutions, which I gather is a variation on one country, two systems. He's close to and reportedly had much to do with forming Hong Xiuju's China platform during her eventually aborted presidential run. And of course, that turned out to be so popular, the KMT kicked her off the ticket. When she was party chair, she created the Sun Yat-sen school and put him in charge. He's also, by the way, frequently quoted in that charming CCP mouthpiece, Global Times. And he recently was part of a group that sued President Tsai, Premier Su, Health Minister Chen Shizhong, for, quote, politicizing the pandemic to benefit themselves. In short, he'd be a total disaster for the party. He's considered, once again, a total long shot. For his campaign, I'd suggest posing in front of a map of China, which includes Taiwan, and the slogan, Surrender. In three, two, one country, two systems. The fourth declared candidate, current chair Johnny Jiang, is almost certainly the most reformist candidate of the bunch of the candidates, already declared or likely to run. He's also the youngest at age 49 and the one with the best electoral record. He has consistently won big in his Feng Yuan district. Now, I've met him twice. And he took out nearly 30 minutes in an anti-pollution rally to chat with me when I was the Taichung AmCham chair. We mostly talked about Taichung public transportation policy. The other time I met him, when he came to speak at an AmCham dinner, I jokingly asked him what it was about former heads of the government information office that makes them want to run for mayor of, of Taichung. He held that post, as did the then mayor Lin Jialong, and his predecessor, Jason Hu. He got the joke and laughed. He was running in the KMT primary for Taichung mayor at the time, a race he lost by less than 1%. The primary is based on, a, on phone polling, and in the end, he lost by roughly 20 votes. Surprisingly, he was a good sport about it, and despite there being ample grounds to contest the primary, he instead immediately threw his support behind Lu Xiu Yen. Who knows, if he had instead worked the crowd at that rally instead of chatting with me, maybe he would have won. <laughs> his family has been in Taiwan for hundreds of years and is associated with the local red faction. Usu or unusually, he isn't related to the families that dominate the red faction, but apparently they didn't have a good candidate to run in his district a traditional red faction stronghold, so he approached them for their blessing. He isn't a strong ideologue and clearly understands which direction the party needs to go to re regain voters' trust. He tried but failed to get the 92 consensus removed from the party platform at the party congress last year, but has had a little success in moving the party closer to the U.S. Now, he was defeated due to several factors. Old school party heavyweights in the party, like Ma ying worked hard to undermine him and no doubt will continue to. Plus, he's young in a party dominated by elderly people and was elected in a by-election. So he's considered a mere caretaker chair and not taken terribly seriously. Apparently, when the KMT Legislative Caucus, which he's a part of, launched their ruckus takeover of the legislature during their early racto pork protests, he was totally caught unaware and had to race back to Taipei to join in. So he's uh, not exactly in, entirely in control of the agenda.
And over 80% of the party rank and file, according to an internal KMT poll, also supported the 92 consensus, in spite of it being overwhelmingly rejected by the electorate at large. In short, he's been trying to pull the party closer to the center where all the cool voters are, but the party is like a drunk at the One China dive bar and doesn't want to leave. Still, he is considered one of the more serious candidates. If he were to win this time for a full term, he would no longer be considered a mere temporary caretaker, which would give him more heft and influence. Of the four declared candidates, he is by far the most popular and viable. The threat, however, comes from those who might yet enter the race. Jiang has already declared that if he wins, he won't, as is traditional in the party, run for president in 2024, but instead will work to be a kingmaker for another candidate. This is almost certainly intended as a strategy to try and keep others out of the race for chair by leaving open a deal to be made whereby they support him for chair and he supports their presidential run from the powerful position of chair. As we saw in the last presidential primary, then chair Wu Duanyi managed to get the rules changed multiple times to pave the way for Han Guoyu to win the nomination. His target is almost certainly specifically Eric Chu, or Zhu Liluan, and there have been stories in the local papers about secret meetings between them. Zhu hasn't tipped his hand whether he will run or not, but he's been acting like somebody who is, but more on that later in part two. If Zhu throws his support behind Jiang, that would give Jiang a decent chance to win against all the widely rumored candidates out there, though Han Guoyu might give him a run for it. My suggestion for his slogan is electability. Remember what that feels like? All right, this wraps up part one. In the next part, we'll go into the likely and some less likely candidates who may enter the race and what to watch for. Oh, be sure to hit like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Hit the bell if you're on YouTube to get notifications. And we would love it if you join us as a patron on patreon.com slash Taiwan Report. Thank you very much. This has been brought to you by the Taiwan Report. For more content like this, become our patron at report.tw. Oh, 就是那个台湾狗啦，最喜欢我的台湾狗了。